Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Today we are looking at a video called Debunked Socialism Has Never Worked by David Pakman Show. This is a liberal channel. Uh, they have a show that like, I don't know, discusses current events and gives their uh, liberal opinion. Uh, so I suppose David Pakman is gonna explain. Uh, it says our long-form deep dive debunking the false notion that socialism has never worked. Well, I certainly think that socialism has worked and does work, and that socialism is in fact not only superior to capitalism but also necessary. But somehow, considering that David Pakman is a liberal, I, I have a feeling that what he thinks socialism is, is quite different from what I think. So let's take a look. Socialism has never worked. It's become a truism repeated by right-wingers and people who just don't know much about political theory. It could be something someone tries to say when you tell them you voted for Bernie Sanders. Psh, Bernie Sanders, don't you know that socialism has never worked? Many don't know much about the history of socialism or even really understand what socialism actually is. They hear the word socialism and they think of authoritarian regimes like the Soviet Union or North Korea. <sighs> oh, oh, oh yes, evil authoritarianism, can't have that. I am not a socialist, but I can only understand that if I actually know what socialism is, so let's begin there. Defined by a textbook, socialism is the collective ownership of a society's means of production. Means of production could be non-human resources used to produce things of economic value like real estate or farmland, natural resources, equipment, buildings, infrastructure, roads, and collective ownership of these things meaning workers or the public own them. Now this is the actual definition, so if we could only stick to this, then we would be fine. Some define socialism as a system by which social equality can be achieved. In this broader way of thinking about it, socialism could mean any kind of socialistic philosophies or attitudes or tendencies, or a system that combines orthodox socialist practices with other constructs like capitalism. It's pretty funny, he complains that right-wingers say stupid things like, oh, Obama is a socialist. Implying that Obama is himself a socialist. But then Pacman himself turns around and says, Sweden is socialistic, and whenever the government does stuff, it's socialistic. No, that's not what socialism is. Socialistic ideals are seen being portrayed in the Hebrew Bible, which in many places says that people should be treated equally and that we should be generous to the have-nots. In Zoroastrianism, the prophet Nazdak the Younger in 6th century Persia promoted the implementation of social welfare and- Yeah, but what? This is so irrelevant. Socialism is not just basic ideas of charity or basic ideas of kindness. The term socialism itself wasn't used until the early 19th century in Western Europe by philosophers and social critics like Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Henri de Saint-Simon, and Robert Owen. At first, the word was used not to describe any one political system, but as an abstraction, a philosophy that societies could or should operate to serve the collective. And then over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, there were many, many different philosophies that branched out of this to form separate socialist intellectual movements. This is where the idea that socialism means any one thing is dispelled. This is basically one of the core arguments running through his whole video, this idea that there are just infinite and countless numbers of different types of socialism, therefore you shouldn't see Marxism, let alone Marxism-Leninism, as any more important or any more impactful or influential or significant, because there are just so many countless types of socialism. And I think that this is why he also stresses that Sweden is socialistic and like every place is socialistic because he wants to exaggerate how many types of socialism there are. He talks about Saint-Simon and Owen and Proudhon and whoever else, but the fact is there are probably zero Owenist parties or Owenist organizations today. There are probably zero parties today with a program that is mainly based on Saint-Simon or Fourier or somebody like that. Utopian socialism that existed before Marxism is discussed as part of history, as a theoretical mistake that was eventually overcome, but apart from that it holds absolutely no relevance today, so talking about it as if it's some kind of real thing today is just dishonest and just a waste of time. You can tell that Pacman's whole goal in this is to emphasize these totally irrelevant things like ancient religions, various flavors of utopianism that have been completely extinct for a long time, he spends a lot of time talking about things which are merely socialistic and not even socialism, even according to him. And he praises anarchism and all kinds of things like that. His whole purpose is that then he can turn around and say, see, communism is not important, Marxism is not important, Marxism-Leninism is not important. 
Marxism, Leninism is a failure, actually existing socialism is a failure, communism is a failure. Really, you should focus on other kinds of things like ancient religions, Sweden, utopian socialism, and anarchism. Marxism advocates a revolution wherein a society's means of production are taken by force, rather than by reform or negotiation or slower forms of transition. I think it is worth pointing out that, according to Marx, it's not absolutely necessary that the revolution has to be very violent. If the proletariat is strong enough, and if the capitalist government is weak enough, then it is completely plausible that the workers could overthrow the government without the need for much bloodshed. Or they could even take over the government somehow electorally, and if they had a powerful enough majority, they could, you know, change the constitution to be socialist or something. That's not entirely out of the realm of possibility. It might not be very likely in most instances, but it is still possible. But it doesn't really matter what the method of revolution is, whether it be an armed uprising, uh, whether it be a general strike that turns into a mass movement that overthrows the government, or even a totally peaceful process, it's still gonna be a revolution where the workers eventually, at the end of the day, oust the capitalist class. The means of production will then be controlled by a proletarian state, which in theory will lead to an egalitarian stateless society that governs itself without coercive institutions. Really important point here. This is not what the Soviet Union or its, quote, communist successors achieved or were working toward, despite their pretenses. Bolshevism, Maoism, and the like are inherently right-wing, totalitarian perversions of Marxism. As I was watching this, I was eagerly awaiting Okay, let's see, what kind of argument is he gonna make? What kind of evidence is he gonna provide? What kind of sources is he gonna cite? Well, the answer is, he doesn't make any argument, he doesn't provide any evidence, he doesn't cite any sources, he just claims Bolshevism is right-wing, Maoism is right-wing, Marxism-Leninism is a distortion of Marxism. You know, you gotta love when a liberal who is not even a Marxist is like, trying to school all these Marxists about what Marxism really is. Like, oh hey, listen up Marxists, you're not real Marxists. Mao, you're not a real Marxist. Lenin, you're not a real Marxist. You're a traitor to Marxism. I know, I'm a liberal after all. No, you don't know anything. In direct contrast to Marxism and other forms of state socialism is libertarian socialism, where there's an emphasis on having a state that is either small and decentralized or completely non-existent. One version of libertarian socialism is anarchism, which is a set of socialist movements that generally oppose the idea of hierarchies and authority altogether, especially the state. Really, no variation or stage of anarchism involves government by definition, and almost all schools of anarchism see any type of hierarchy as either unnecessary or unethical in any kind of human interaction. A boss at the workplace, a leader in a social movement, whatever the case may be. I mean, maybe so, but practically anarchist movements also have leaders almost always and you know maybe it is heresy to anarchists or maybe it is some kind of paradox or something but there have been plenty of anarchist governments or governments where anarchists have worked with uh, you know other people whether it be in the civil war in Spain in the 1860s and 1870s or in Spain in the 1930s or what have you. There's anarcho-syndicalism, which can be thought of as a sort of extension of anarchist communism, where the means of production are controlled by confederated trade unions called syndicates. This type of anarchism actually manifested in Catalonia, Spain, right before World War II. In this instance, socialism worked. Almost all industries and aspects of the economy were collectivized, and society functioned efficiently without capitalism or money. Under anarcho-syndicalism, Catalonia saw a growth in wealth and production, and absence of poverty. Okay, now, at this point, like, does he have any source? Of course not. He doesn't have any sources. I am by no means an expert on Spanish history, but I did take a look at a couple of history books and articles about this, which is certainly better than what Pacman did because he doesn't have any sources. He cites absolutely nothing. He basically just makes stuff up. He claims that anarchism built some kind of heaven on earth, but this is what historian Sademan has to say about Spanish anarchism in the 1930s. Quote, the collectives contributed to organized selfishness on a local level. Prosperous collectives frequently refused to aid less affluent ones. Collectives' autonomy became, in the words of CNT, which is the anarchist group, CNT leader Horatio Prieto, permanent egotism. Collectives intransigently refused to share vehicles at their disposal, thus aggravating a grave transportation shortage. For example, beets destined for sugar processing plants had to be left in the fields and eventually used as animal feed because of lack of transport and containers. Local independence and egotism made information gathering impossible. In spite of our appeals, no one, absolutely no one, in the villages responded to requests for statistical information. 
The flow of knowledge did not improve even though, on 28th January 1937, the Council of Aragon threatened to confiscate all unreported stocks. At times, the regional government made good its threat and seized unauthorized goods and fined their owners, even if cooperatives or collectives. The refusal to provide statistics and the concealment of goods enabled the villages and collectives to avoid paying debts. The most typical case of debt and waste was the village of Angies, which had received important credits for a large quantity of fertilizers and used only a third of what it was loaned, which is called embezzlement. The town squandered both fertilizer and transportation. Collectivists wasted large quantities of subsidized bread and other items provided at below market prices." Unquote. So at least according to this historian, this notion that oh, they just had these really idyllic autonomous collectives which just worked completely flawlessly and productivity was insanely high and there was no waste and no corruption and nothing bad happened. It sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true. The anarchists first tried to create a decentralized system which led to these kinds of problems. The autonomous collectives would try to steal and hoard scarce resources for themselves and not to give them to anybody else. So the anarchists had to crack down, confiscate all the goods that they had hidden. And according to the anarchist leaders themselves, this was permanent egotism and permanent selfishness and deliberate hiding of goods and information from the authorities. And that's not because the citizens were just evil, it's because they were starving and these goods were scarce, so of course they didn't want to give them away, they would rather hide them. So I'm not criticizing the anarchists for cracking down on this type of criminal behavior, I'm just pointing out that it's naive to think that these kinds of problems wouldn't exist. Uh, the historian goes on, quote, Civilians were starved enough to become an enemy within and thus to create serious conflict. Many inhabitants of Valencia, the capital city after November 1936, were hungry, fearful and depressed. At the end of the year, women, tired of spending hours in queues, engaged in street protests against high prices. Lack of transport caused the rotting of Valencian citrus and rice in the fall and winter of 1937. The shortage of trucks led to the abandonment of food shipments destined for troops defending Madrid. The same insufficiency made it difficult to collect milk for dairy production. Drivers could easily take advantage of the situation by demanding higher pay and engaging in illegal trading activities. This is eerily reminiscent of what happened in Soviet Russia. The railway workers also tried to squeeze the government for higher wages and basically blackmail them like, oh, you gotta pay us more, otherwise we're gonna sabotage the whole economy. Well, the same thing was clearly happening in the anarchist territory as well. He goes on, Agricultural wage laborers in Aragon further objected to low wages. Workers fought against the officially set wage scale and apparently had refused to work. Unquote. Officially set wage scales? What is this? Stalinism? Is this is this evil authoritarianism? Is this the Soviet Union? Authoritarian regimes like the Soviet Union. I thought that was evil and Stalinist and Marxist and whatnot. I thought anarchism was supposed to be just a bunch of rainbows and gummy bears. It seems that in the countryside, the autonomous anarchist collectives were systematically trying to hide their statistics so that they could hide the goods that they were making and not give them to anybody else. But, at least for the urban population, we actually have statistics on production and wages. Production in Catalonia in 1936 was already lower than during the Great Depression. And according to these statistics, in 1937 it was 70% of that production. Then it decreased to 59%. And in 1938 it further decreased to about 30%. The anarchists uh, could boast of increased productivity in individual cotton factories or cotton mills. However, according to these statistics, that was a rare exception, because overall cotton production in 1936 was 60%, in 1937 it decreased to 36% and to 13.7%. Unfortunately, this doesn't have the exact unemployment rate. It only has the unemployment rate compared to January and June 1936, which was already high. But this says that in 1937, unemployment was 
120 percent of 1936 figures which must have been quite high and then if you look at the cost of living it starts out at like 150 percent in 1936 that increases to around 200 or 300 percent in 1937 and at the very end it's like 400 450 percent so you can imagine that even if the wages are increasing somewhat well with the inflation and with the cost of living increasing to like 450 percent you're gonna be pretty poor under Anarcho-syndicalism, Catalonia saw a growth in wealth and production and absence of poverty. And absence of poverty. You're gonna be pretty poor if the cost of living is just going through the roof. Historian Fraser writes about this. He says, quote, Catalan production fell in the first year of the war by 30%, and in the cotton working sector of the textile industry by twice as much. Overall unemployment, complete and partial, rose by nearly a quarter in the first year, and this despite the military mobilization decreed in September 1936. Cost of living quadrupled in just over two years." Unquote growth in wealth and production and absence of poverty. One of the anarchist leaders, Albert Perez Barro, stated, quote, production has fallen in an alarming manner and in many instances has plummeted, unquote. The anarchist economy was practically bankrupt for most of the war and the anarchists were constantly asking the Spanish state to give them money. So if anarchism was so fantastic and they never had any problems, then why would they tell these evil statists of the, of the Spanish Republic, the Spanish state, to give them money? Well, the truth is they were absolutely bankrupt and they were desperate. Historian Bolitan writes, quote, So desperately did some of them require funds that Juan Peiro, the anarcho-syndicalist minister of industry, openly recommended intervention by the central government, having received in his department 11,000 requests for funds in January 1937 alone." Unquote. And of course, for the sake of fairness and for the sake of accuracy, we have to point out that this was wartime, so many of these economic difficulties were made much worse because of the war. It is understandable that production might fall during the war, that there might be starvation, there might be scarcity like there was. But it's also very probable that the anarchists were simply not very good at running these types of things. And you can tell because they start off by making everything autonomous and decentralized and really relaxed and undisciplined and free. But then so many problems emerge that they have to start implementing stricter measures, stricter controls, more centralization, confiscating hidden goods. In other words, the system that they wanted didn't work, so then they had to implement a different kind of system. You can imagine that it's a recipe for disaster if you make everything decentralized and then goods become scarce, well, why would the decentralized collectives give any of the goods away? All sources will be in the description. I'm also gonna link some of my other videos about this topic, which I encourage you to watch if you're interested. George Orwell described what he saw when he visited Catalonia in the 1930s. It was the first time I had ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Oh yes, Orwell. Well, again, even though I have full sympathy for Catalonia and I truly do wish that they had succeeded, Orwell was not a communist. Orwell was working for the secret services of the US and the UK and he was taking down all the names of communists and giving them to the secret services. He was not a communist, he was an infiltrator and a spy. There is democratic socialism and social democracy, which seek to implement the principles of socialism in the context of a democratic and sometimes capitalist state. Democratic socialism is a really stupid term because socialism by definition is democratic. And really, democratic socialism was only created as a term for people who want to separate themselves from Marxists. And I guess also from anarchists. In the modern context, I suppose, democratic socialists are just people who are reformists, so they think that it's only okay to have socialism if it is achieved through a capitalist parliament. 
which is really just a snobbish attitude to say like, oh, well, the poor people can't have any rights unless it's done properly in an orderly manner through the capitalist parliament. <laughs> like, no, that's just stupid. And social democracy is just not socialism at all. You can't have socialism inside a capitalist state. That's not how it works. So to conclude, of course it is a lie that socialism has never worked. We know that socialism has worked completely fine. Now, Pac-Man claims that he is going to debunk this lie, but he actually doesn't, he only reinforces it. What do I mean by that? Well, Pac-Man says that Marxism-Leninism, which is the most influential form of socialism, is a complete failure and has always failed and is evil and blah blah blah. So he actually only reinforces the lie that socialism doesn't work and that socialism is bad. And why wouldn't he? He's not even a socialist, he's a liberal. In fact, it would be extremely odd if a liberal was supporting any kind of socialism. Maybe there are anarchists or utopians who watch Pacman's video and they're like, Hell yeah, Pacman supports my kind of socialism. Well, maybe that's an argument against your kind of socialism that that anti-communist liberals support it. Pacman claims to defend socialism because he says that anarcho-socialism, utopianism and social democracy are good and have worked. But the problem is, of course, that firstly, anarchism and utopianism have not actually achieved any lasting success of any world historic importance. You can maybe point to short-lived anarchistic experiments, utopian religious communities, or small utopian or anarchist communes hiding out somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But those do not pose any kind of serious threat to global capitalism and cannot serve as a blueprint for a future socialist world. That's just the cold hard truth of the matter. And secondly, of course social democracy is not socialism at all, as Pacman himself even admits. And social democracy has never solved anything. It has all the inherent problems of capitalism, it serves to prolong capitalism, and protects the capitalist ruling class. One of Pacman's main goals in this video is to claim that Marxism or Marxism-Leninism should not be seen as the only form of socialism or communism. He claims that there are absolutely countless kinds of socialist ideologies out there, and Marxism is only one, so... If there's a bazillion types of socialism, then why would you even talk about Marxism? Forget about Marxism, forget about communism. Now, of course, it is technically true that there are tons of other socialist ideologies, but those other types of socialist ideologies are completely irrelevant. As I said, you never see an Owenist or Saint Simonist party. These are pretty obscure writers and they have fallen into obscurity for a reason. Of course, we can list off thousands of these old and forgotten irrelevant ideologies. Narrativism, Trudevism, Menshevism, Menshevik Internationalism, Fourierism, Lasallianism, Bernsteinianism. But the fact is, they are still irrelevant. Sure, you could say there still are revisionists, there still are reformists. So from a historical and theoretical point of view, it's useful to know who Bernstein was. Because he is basically seen as the grandfather of revisionism. But that's basically their only real significance, is that they are ancestors of these things now. So to say, look, there are so many other kinds of socialism, therefore you should just forget about Marxism, certainly forget about Marxism-Leninism, certainly forget about the most influential and significant type of socialism, certainly don't look into the kind of socialism that had any actual importance. It's simply a trick, it's a distraction. You know, I guess I'll say this about the CNT Fay or uh, the Catalonian anarchists, not to be overly critical, of course, they were on the right side, they were fighting against the fascists, they were fighting the good fight, they were allied with the Marxist-Leninists, which, again, is quite strange. If you believe David Pakman, then the Marxist-Leninists were evil authoritarians and not socialists, but the anarchists were great, but, well, the anarchists and the Marxist-Leninists were actually on the same side in this. So I fully sympathize with the CNT Fay, and I wish that they had won the war, but at the same time I think that their anarchist theory was misguided. And it's just foolish to think that, oh, the anarchists are just gonna magically, in the middle of a civil war, they're just gonna build some kind of stateless society where there's no coercion and no violence, there's no poverty, production is increasing like crazy, there's just 
a tremendous increase in wealth all of a sudden. It's just unrealistic in those conditions. And I think David Pakman is only pushing this narrative because he doesn't support anarchism, he doesn't support any kind of socialism, but utopianism, anarchism, and democratic socialism are things that he tolerates. He doesn't support them, but he tolerates them. They are more acceptable to liberals than Marxism-Leninism. So he's not honestly advocating for any of those things, he's just using them as a way of getting people away from Marxism. He would rather that people not be socialists at all, but if they insist on being socialists, then he wants to make sure that they go to utopianism or anarchism or reformism, and that they don't go to communism or Marxism-Leninism. Thanks a lot for watching, I will see you guys next time. Please remember to like and subscribe, and also to turn on the notifications. All my social media is linked in the description, as well as links to my Patreon and my Discord server.